Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at how economic systems impact the environment. A note, um, you could get environmental issues uh, either by FRQ or multiple choice questions. Um, you're not going to have to necessarily know very specific events, but it might help for evidence for free response questions. And we'll be looking at environment in class as well. Let's start by the idea of uh, Kuznets curve. Kuznets curve is a theory that environmental degradation worsens over time until you hit a point and you have industrialized, you become more post-materialist. And then you start to come to the realization that, well, I can't just keep uh, destroying my scarce resources. I have to actually um, improve my environment to allow those score scarce resources to multiply. And so when you become a more service-oriented post-industrial economy, you actually make the environment better. So we have the vertical is the environmental degradation. The, the horizontal is GDP per capita economic growth. So as we already know that there are different types of needs and wants and values in society. And eventually, once you get these safety and, and, uh, psycholo and physiological needs met, then you start getting into post-materialist values, love, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. Well, this is kind of matched with the Kuznets curve because as you get in, out into agricultural type economies, you lose a lot of land and a lot of um, land resources. And then you start getting into an industrial economy, you get into deforestation, you get into really cheap fossil fuels, but there's a point at which that stops and you start saying, okay, well, um, my post-materialist values are kicking in. I wanna save the whales. I wanna um, uh, have positive impacts on climate change or fix the ozone layer, make clean water, clean air, make sure the planet is actually acting better because that overall makes society over, uh, better. Of course, what we wanna do is try to figure out a way to flatten this curve when we get into developing economies. Because one thing we have noticed is, of course, when you start getting into the industrial revolution, you started to see an increase in CO2 emissions. This obviously has a negative impact on the environment in terms of climate change. But there's something where Kuznets curve seems to be proven true, and that's that when you get into de these developed, freer, wealthier countries, the idea of getting rid of CO2 emissions has already started. That when you got into the 1990s especially, you started to see a significant, that realization, post-materialism starts kicking in, the EU, the United Kingdom, and CO2 emissions per capita have in fact been dropping. Well, then what's the problem? Well, the problem is, you have these countries, here's the other AP6, and then we're adding in India, the most populous country in the world. You know, they're, a lot of these countries are just getting into industrialization and big time economic growth. And so how do you get these countries to not degrade their environment while at the same time trying to increase GDP per capita economic growth? Especially when it comes down to it, these two, the most populous countries on the planet. Um, China is industrialized, has already, um, um, primarily industrialized. India is where China maybe was in the 1990s. It's starting to, well, so how do we keep those CO2 emissions per capita down? And this is one of the, the hard parts about economic development. Where How can we get them to avoid what the United States and Europe did during the Industrial Revolution? So let's take a closer look uh, at all of our AP6 countries and some of their environmental issues overall. We're gonna start with the most developed nation, that is the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom's number one problem is air pollution. It's particularly bad in the more industrial north. It is an island, so deforestation is, uh, is still a problem, though they are, 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 there is more forest now in the UK than there was um, in 1900. Um, soil contamination, often due to mining, uh, is a problem. Oil spills in the North Sea between Norway and the UK, problematic and trash overall. Um, how do you reduce um, over, you know, waste pollution? Um, coastal flooding is uh, considerable during uh, large-scale storms, hurricanes, uh, and th that does cause coastal erosion and flooding. And then environmental activism in the United Kingdom is encouraged. Um, there is free expression, free speech in the UK. So activists um, you know, will not, you know, they won't suffer a whole lot of political or, or, or oriented or um, extrajudicial consequences for being active in environmentalism. China's number one problem by far is air pollution, especially in the North. China every winter turns on massive amounts of coal-fired power plants and it can make cities 
basically like you're in a, a perpetual fog. It is really nasty, it is dangerous, and it's said that airborne cancers are, are one of the leading killers of Chinese citizens. Um, water scarcity and water pollution are problematic. This is the largest dam in the world, the Three Gorges Dam. It brings water from where it is in the southern end of China to where it is not in the much drier northern part of China. And uh, it is a massive, massive piece of infrastructure. Um, coastal flooding is problematic when you have typhoons. Um, the Gobi Desert in northern China is slowly encroaching in on China. I, it, it, every year it, it sneaks in a couple of feet and China is working actively to prevent that uh, desertification. Um, Activism exists, environmental activism exists in China as long as you don't basically alienate the CCP. If you go through the process of having to go through the party, then you're going to get a lot more done. If you alienate, if you're actively, publicly against the CCP and what they aren't doing to help the environment, it's going to get you in trouble. Um, you have to go through that party apparatus to to work. And um, they do in their five-year plans, because China still does five-year plans, it still runs on that kind of socialist model, they do have environmental um, uh, issues and environmental help to deal with their, uh, their current states in terms of climate change, that kind of thing. Is it really working? Uh, it's really up in the air at this point. Um, Mexico's number one problem is also air pollution. Uh, Mexico City is said to be one of the dirtiest cities on planet Earth in terms of air pollution. There are obviously tens of millions of people in Mexico City. Uh, Mexico City is also suffering from a problem of, of drought and clean water, um, access to that water. There are some neighborhoods that do not have access to water. Water, ha Groundwater has run out and they have to truck it into those neighborhoods. Uh, deforestation is a problem. Mexico is one of those countries that's almost on the verge of hitting that the, the tip of, of Kuznets curve, uh, but not quite yet. Soil erosion from mining and oil uh, drilling, um, toxic waste is problematic. Activism is encouraged. Um, they do have free expression. Um, some of the problems, however, is the activists uh, run into cartels and um, on, on land that is run by cartels. Sometimes you will see um, uh, murders, violence, uh, having to do with cartel members, you know, they don't really care about what you care about logging or butterfly habitats or, or whatever. They're going to do what they're going to do. And if you get in the way, you put yourself in danger. Okay. Uh, Iran's number one problem. Hey, look, another one, air pollution, especially in the North. It is of course an oil producing state that's going to cause an enormous amounts of air pollution. Uh, smog in Tehran is very bad. Um, there is, significant amounts of deforestation. A lot of land is really not usable in Iran because it is kind of arid in the areas that are deforested in the north. Uh, it's not helping. There's a significant amount of drought. It is in the Middle East, and some of the worst oil spills in the world do occur in the Persian Gulf, which is right there uh, in near Iran. Activism is um, repressed. Basically, the Iranian regime has no interest in uh, your feelings about uh, what goes on in terms of environmental uh, activism. And so uh, if you are actively against the government and you step over um, any kind of significant protest line, um, you will be jailed for it. Uh, Russia has significant problems with deforestation and wildfires. Uh, wildfires in the Siberian tundra can be massive and cause enormous amounts of smoke. This has to do with the warming environment and climate change. Um, air pollution is pretty rampant. Uh, there's a ton of mining in Russia, and so you will see uh, significant amounts of soil erosion, toxic waste, oil spills. Um, it, it's the, the, the ground issues in, in Russia are, are significant. Um, activism does exist in Russia, obviously, during the war with Ukraine, any activism against the government at all is extremely suppressed. But even before that, under Putin's regime, you were allowed to maybe, um, if you got the right connections, um, talk to the government about environmental issues. But if it interrupted the flow of the money to the oligarchs or to Putin's you know, own connections, you put yourself at risk of getting jailed and um, you would not want that in Russia. The last one is Nigeria. Nigeria, of course, is a rentier state. The number one problem is located in the Niger Delta. It's one of the largest oil producing regions on the planet. Oil spills, thick, 
really nasty um, because of pirating. A lot of oil is taking inland and then it's illegally refined and the waste is just basically ejected right back into the rivers and waterways. It is really, 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 really in a sad state. Um, there is significant uh, deforestation, especially in the north. Um, herding is still a really big deal, uh, uh, beef production, and so a lot of forests will get torn down, so ranching and herding um, can take precedent. There's a lot of violence, actually, in the Middle Belt in the north between herders and farmers. Uh, soil erosion, desertification in the north, also problematic, and significant amounts of flooding the infrastructure especially in the Delta regions, uh, is just the government doesn't really put anything towards it. And so when you get um, massive storms, you get significant amounts of flooding. Activism does exist in Nigeria, but it's super minimal. Um, since the government is so corrupt, uh, if, if you do become an active participant in environmentalism, it could cost you your life if you run up against the wrong um, people uh, in government. Um, the uh, oil companies and their connections with uh, the government of Nigeria, um, you know, they don't put up with a lot of environmental activism against them. And then the government gets so much money, even though it's it's corrupt, um, that, that you could find yourself in, in a whole world of hurt and possibly dead um, if you're going up against them. All right, so that's the environmental issues of the AP6, kind of the main ones you're focused on. Um, we are going to hit some specifics as we go on throughout the semester, but you just give you an idea, again, how the environmental issues of the AP6 countries are going.